name is Richard Wesley, and I'm the pastor here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. I am thrilled that you have joined us today. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Have you ever experienced something in your life that was devastating? Have you ever lived through an experience that caused you grief, pain, or, or anguish? Have you ever experienced any of that and then looking back on that wondering, what is a Christian response to all I've been through? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at in today's Jesus story. I, I want you to listen very carefully in a little while when Robert Knightsky reads our Jesus story to us. I want you to listen carefully because these elements are in that story. We're going to talk about that. Also, let me remind you, today is Communion Sunday. And if you haven't already done so, I would hope that you will get some bread or crackers and maybe some wine or juice or another beverage of your choice. So after the teaching time, you'll join us in Holy Communion. Again, I'm thrilled that you're here. gospel lesson this morning is found in the book of Mark. 
As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a de deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came to do. And he went out throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had a bad experience? Have you ever lived through a situation that caused you pain or sorrow? Have you ever been frustrated to the point of major distraction? Have you ever experienced emotional disheaval? Have you ever had challenges that were so daunting that you weren't sure you were going to make it through, yet somehow you made it and here you are? Have you ever wondered how to make Christian sense of all of those challenges and experiences? We all face those challenges. Some involve the death of loved ones. Some involve raising children. Some grow out of having elderly parents and the health issues they face. Some involve COVID-19 or other serious illnesses. Even trials at school and work can cause us anguish and pain. So what are we to do with all of those challenges, especially after we've survived and lived through them. Well, this week we have a story that sheds some light on what Jesus leads one of his followers to do with her experience growing out of a serious illness. In last Sunday's text, Jesus had just preached a sermon of good news when just then, in their synagogue, a man possessed of evil showed up. We talked about that suspense last Sunday. Well, the story moves from that synagogue to the house where Peter lives. Houses in this culture are multifamily dwellings. So this is where Peter and his wife and her mother live, along with Andrew and possibly even his wife and some of their extended family members. The opening scene finds Peter's mother-in-law in bed with a fever. While we don't know much about her illness, we do know that it was enough to keep her from her culturally defined duties. Now, a fever in that uh, time and that severity could be what we would call malaria. Now, other possibilities exist that would not necessarily be fatal, but could linger on for a year or even longer. So in our story, Mark informs us that as soon as Jesus, Peter, and Andrew leave the synagogue from last week's story, they go to Andrew and Peter's house, and they take James and John with them. They explain to Jesus that 
Peter's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. So Jesus does the culturally unacceptable thing. He goes into her bedroom and touches her. Mark says he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her. So do you, do you see the picture so far? A sinister scene takes place in the community house of worship. Evil is found lurking in their midst. It shows up at church. And it knows to be afraid of Jesus. I know who you are, the demon said. You are the Holy One of Israel. And Jesus silenced the demon and set the possessed man free of that torment. We no longer talk about our struggles as demon possession, but we still have real challenges. Some so severe that when we come through to the other side, we know that we have experienced the very presence of God. One of our members said just the other day, I don't know how people make it in this life without God. So Peter's mother-in-law is experiencing a life-altering challenge. Hers happens to be a serious illness. The illness is so severe that she cannot attend to her culturally defined duties. Family and friends are concerned. Will she survive? Will this illness cause other family problems, possibly depleting much needed resources? Well, the solution for her and her family is found in Jesus. Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her. But our story doesn't stop with Jesus providing the solution to her problem. In fact, this is where the story is just beginning for her. This is also where I wish we all read and spoke Greek. <laughs> The New Revised Standard Version, the version that I love, the version that you heard Robert read from just a few moments ago, the New Revised Standard Version says, Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. And she began to serve. Them. I, I'm not positive what you hear, but I hear she got up and continued her culturally expected role. And that is exactly not what the scripture is saying. First of all, the Greek tense is that she got up and served with them. If you're reading this in the Greek, she got up and served with them, along beside them. Not served them, but served with them. So whatever she is doing, it's the same thing Jesus, Peter, Andrew, James, and John are doing. So if she's cooking dinner, well, Jesus, Peter, Andrew, James, and John are in there bumping around the kitchen with her because they're all doing it together. The second issue with our English translation is the Greek word translated serve. The actual Greek word is diakono. Now, even my Amazon Alexa, and I hope I didn't just spoil your day, <laughs> but, but even that device tells me that diakono pertains to a deacon or clergy. This is the same word the Apostle Paul used to identify himself as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, let's look at what we have so far, because it gets better. Evil has disrupt, disrupted a man's life and finds its way into the space of worship. 
Jesus sets the man free of his tormentuous demon and then heads out to Peter and Andrew's house with some friends. Upon arriving at the house, Jesus learns that Peter's mother-in-law is in bed with a serious illness. And even though cultural practice would not allow Jesus to enter the bedroom of an unrelated woman, Jesus goes into her bedroom and cures her illness. She then gets up and joins Jesus, Peter, Andrew, James, and John in the ministry that they are involved in. But what ministry is she participating in? Well, the very next verse answers our question. That evening at sunset, they brought to Jesus all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Remember, Peter's mother-in-law is doing whatever Jesus, Peter, Andrew, James, and John are doing to offer hope and help to the people. So when our story tells us Jesus is casting out demons and curing illnesses, we've already been told that it's a cooperative effort, that there are other people involved in this with Jesus. Do, do you remember when the Billy Graham Association was interested in seeing people's lives changed for the good of the kingdom of God? Did you ever attend one of those Billy Graham crusades back then? Do you know that it took hundreds of people to facilitate one evening of a Billy Graham crusade? It wasn't just Billy Graham. It was a cooperative effort. Jesus is not performing a one-person renegade mission. We've just been told that Peter's mother-in-law is ministering with Jesus, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Yes, Jesus is the team leader, but success comes because others are involved in this life-changing effort with Jesus. And they are changing lives. But they didn't finish the work. Did you notice that? Listen again. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. He cured many, not all. He cast out many of those demons, not all. The work has started, but there's still much to be done. And then Mark says, in the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. And he answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that we may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons. Jesus knowing the work is not finished, leaves town. Does that bother you? Is this what Jesus does? He gets some good things started, and then he runs out on the very people who need him? Does that bother you? Well, well let, me, let me explain why it shouldn't bother you. Because the answer to this question also answers the question of what is the Christian response to our grief and pain 
and anguish. Jesus leaves the village and takes the good news to the next village where people are experiencing grief, pain, and anguish. However, he doesn't leave the village without help. We know Peter's mother-in-law has experienced illness. She has been healed. She has joined Jesus in offering hope and help that flows out of her own life experience. Here is a woman who sets the example of what to do after coming through a difficult life experience. She takes her experience and offers hope and help to others who have no hope. Some had been cured, but not all. There was still work to be done. Have you ever had a bad experience? Have you ever lived through a situation that caused you pain and sorrow? Have you ever been frustrated to the point of major distraction? Have you ever experienced emotional dis disheval? Have you ever had challenges that were so daunting that you weren't sure how you were going to make it through and yet somehow you made it and here you are? Have you ever wondered how to make Christian sense of all of those life experiences and challenges? We all face those challenges. Some involve the death of loved ones. Some involve rearing children. Some grow out of having elderly parents and the health issues they face. Some involve serious illnesses like COVID-19 and others. Even trials at school and work can cause us anguish and pain. So what are we to do with all of those challenges, especially after we have survived them and lived through them? Well, we turn to others who are going through similar kinds of pain and we offer hope and help to them. Out of our struggle, we help others. I'm not sure God can fully use any of us effectively until we've struggled, until we've gone through challenges, and then we can help others the way we've been helped. Now, now let me be clear here. God does not cause our suffering, but God comes alongside us in our suffering. We are called to come alongside others who are also struggling. The Christian response to our grief, our pain, and our anguish is to walk with someone else through their grief their pain, and their anguish. I believe Jesus calls us to use the gifts God has provided. God asks you to offer hope and help to those who experience some of the same struggles you've had. You can offer hope and help because you have been in similar situations. So God calls us to offer hope and help. God provides us strength to live God's calling. One of the ways God provides for us and strengthens us is by calling us to the table of Jesus Christ. We in the United Methodist Church understand that the table that we call Holy Communion does not belong to our local congregation, not even to our denomination. It belongs to all who seek to love Jesus. So I invite you to join us now for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. 
and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You sit on your throne above the earth and beyond the sky. Your power is more than we can comprehend. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He healed the sick, cast out demons, and gave us the example of prayer to you. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood, that the world might live in peace. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all of the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Let us be all things to all people that they may know your redeeming love. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today you have learned a Christian response to grief, pain, and anguish. Now, please understand, right now you might be in the middle of pain, grief, and anguish, and be in need of letting others help you. It is only as you are coming out of your grief, pain, and anguish that God enables you to offer help to others. If you're in the middle of your struggle and would like to talk to me, you can reach me by email at stbumc at gmail.com or you can call and leave a message at the church office. I would love the opportunity to talk with you. Speaking of helping others, our food pantry uh, we call it Ann's Closet here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church, is running very low on some staple food items. We need soup, dried beans, spaghetti sauce, peanut butter, jelly, canned fruit, and oatmeal. You can always donate financially to help the cause as well. Be sure you mark your gift for Ann's Closet or Food Pantry. God bless you. We'll see you next time.